why don't you just walk us through sort of this year's draft process and, and maybe how it differs from uh, what we're used to? Uh, it's, uh, it's very different um, than what we're used to. I can tell you that. It's, um, it's you know, one of a kind, and, and it seems like it's never ending, to be totally honest with you. It's one of those things where we are – we are doing what we can within the guidelines that the league has given us and um, we're making the best of it. You know, thankfully our, our scouting department, our front offices is designed to, uh, you know, not be too thrown off by these new, these new ways of doing things. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it, it seems like forever since we've seen these players, um, they, they might be completely different from the last time we saw them and playing in March. And, you know, we're just, uh, we're basing a lot of these decisions on, on extensive film work discussions as a staff and, and a lot of background um, digging on, on players to, to get as much info as we can to, you know, to make a, an educated decision come draft night. So it's, um, it, it's going to look a little different, the process leading up to it, but, you know, hopefully when it all said and done, looking back on it, it won't be much different in terms of the outcome of it. Cool. Well, I'm going to start off with some questions. First one is going to Mike Ganter from the Toronto Sun. Hey, Dan. How you doing? Mike, how are you, man? Doing fine. Um, just wondering, is, is, there, is there a way this could be advantageous for, for the Toronto Raptors? I mean, based on how you go about your scouting? Um, I, I think – you know, I don't want to say advantageous as much as we're not looking at it as a as a negative by any means. Like we, like I said, the way that we do things to begin with, um, we don't need to change much of our operation. Um, and and I think that you know we're a we're a front office that that spends a lot of time digging in on guys throughout the entire season. Not even not just during the pre-draft. So a lot of the work we've done, it happened earlier in the year while the games were still going on. So we feel pretty comfortable with where things were at when, when everything got changed. And um, I think now it's just, it's going to come down to trusting in our, our gut feeling on, on some of these players that, you know, we don't have the, the pre-draft process to, to change your mind after seeing guys, you know, here or there or watching them mm -hmm. um, through different, different setups of whether it's the combine drills or or three on three settings that, that we usually do so you know going based on what our initial feeling was on guys you know like it's going to be interesting to see if if not just us but if, if teams in general um if the, how the draft goes in terms of of team basing their their picks on on gut feeling and, and video and and you know how this goes it, it could really kind of change the way people approach pre-draft going forward Got it. Thanks, Dan. Oh, going to go next to Doug Smith from the Toronto Star. Hey, Dan, how are you these days? Good, good. Good, good to see you. you. Um, I just wondered, how much have you missed the the one-on-one -on -one interaction, the dinners, the meetings, the really getting to know guys? Because I presume that's very important draft process, and you haven't been able to do basically any of it, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we value the um, – the visits that the players usually come up to Toronto and get to know them in person. And um, honestly, like it's a really good opportunity to sell the city to, to, to a lot of these guys who've never been to out of the country or, or especially to Toronto. And um, it, it's unfortunate for, for that side of things to, to kind of miss out on that opportunity. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're still getting some one-on-one -on -one time. We're, we're doing a lot of zoom interviews and, and of course you, it doesn't recreate the in, interperson yeah. um, discussions, but we're doing our best to at least get to know them through those sorts of interviews, but then also, you know, reaching out and, and talking to people within their, within their circles to, to just kind of learn as much as we can. And, and um, more than, more than anything, a lot of times what we do is we'll, we'll talk to guys, early in the pre-draft and they'll, they'll talk about, you know, all the different things they're working on, what they're hoping to, to change in their game as they transition to the NBA. And, and usually the workouts, the visits, that sort of thing, we get to see that firsthand and, and see all the, the transitions they're making. And, you know, we're, we're not getting a lot of that this year. Um, and, and that's going to be a little different in terms of, you know, in the Zoom interviews, they talk about 
changing their diets and, and, you know, they've dropped 15 pounds or whatever. And it's like, we're, we're not going to be able to really get a good look on guys to, to see how, how realistic some of those, those things are. Great. Thanks, thanks very much, Dan. And good luck with this. So no idea how it'll work out. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Next up, we got Josh Lewinberg from TSN. Hey Dan, how you doing? I'm good, Josh. Thanks for doing this. First of all, um, you mentioned the NBA guidelines earlier in terms of what they're allowing teams to do and, and what you guys can't do. Is there anything any different specifically for the Raptors given the restrictions in Canada in terms of travel and, and whatnot? Uh, I mean, not really because because the, the, the NBA is restricting a lot of, of the, the player travel as well just out of an abundance of caution, you know, they don't want people traveling around to too many um, different markets. It's not like there's a combine there. I mean, they're, they're doing some virtual uh, form of it where within the player's market, they're able to do the different workouts and, and testing and that sort of thing. So they're trying to do as much localized as possible. And, and um, you know, we're, we're traveling as best we can under, under these, these confines and, and, and um, you know, it's, the, the border restrictions and whatnot, like we're, we're working with them and it's not, uh, it's nothing that's going to stop us from being able to do what we have to do in the pre-draft. Sort of following up on Doug's question as well, you talked about the interview process, uh, getting to normally meet with these guys face to face and how much you miss by not doing that. But even just in terms of having them in your own gym, and obviously you guys feel really good about your player development staff. How much do you miss not getting those guys, your staff able to kind of get, their hands on these guys and, and put them through drills during this process. Yeah, that's big. I mean, it's always after every workout um, in, a, in a regular draft, after every workout, I usually have a, a, a bit of a, a um, discussion with our coaching staff that, that was, that took part in the, in the workouts and, and get their feedback a lot on what they thought about, you know, whether it's athleticism, speed, like the guy, the way the guys interacted, their, their um, understanding of the different drills and, and IQ type things and not being able to have that from the Raptors perspective in terms of what we usually look for in players. It's, it's, it, I definitely say it's not something that's going to make it impossible for us, but it, it's just a valued part of the process that we just won't have this year. Thanks, Dan. Take care. Next, we go to Blake Murphy from The Athletic. Hey, Dan. How are you, man? I'm good, Blake. Um, in terms of, you, you know, you mentioned a little bit things like a guy says he's going to work on this and, and then in a workout you could actually see it with some of the uncertainty around what two ways and, and even the G League might look like next year. How do you guys weigh that kind of developmental capacity that, that you guys have looked for in prospects like Terrence or O'Shea or, or Pascal? Like, like what is that? How does the, the potential weirdness of the G League or, or the training camp or the summer league situation change things for you guys kind of in terms of how you project these guys a year out yeah I mean that's a it's definitely a a work a, a, you know something that we're trying to figure out right now like it's um it's going to impact how we how we address the the two-way the, the exhibit 10 um, G kind of G League mentality big time because we don't we just don't know for one what what those sorts of of um, deals that, that these players would be on, like how it'll impact their ability to go um, and, and continue to develop. But, you know, honestly, we feel really comfortable in whoever we target and, and bring in, we know that our development program is in place regardless of what the, what the type of deal that they're on or what the, um, what the status is within the, within the, the organization. But we know that once guys get with us, there's a reason there, there's, they've shown enough potential to, to draw the interest in the first place. And we, we just feel comfortable that as, as long as we, we bring in the right types of guys that are, that are wired the way that all the guys that we've had success with are that, you know, regardless of what the season actually brings, um, the development work is still going to be there. The, the, the practice time is still going to, all the hours of work are still going to get put in. And, and we, we fully trust our, our development staff to, to work with these guys and, you know, how, how it looks might be a little different, but in the, in the end, you know, a few months on the line, I, I think that we'll, we'll feel pretty comfortable with the trajectory that these guys are on.
Uh, and just one more for you. My colleague Eric Kareen is not on this call, but he has an annual question for you or Bobby in these situations. Who are you drafting? <laughs> oh man, I think I feel like my my response is to Eric is always um, I, like, "Do you have any ideas?" Or, or like, <laughs> "Can can he give a suggestion at this point?" He cannot. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. The same then. Next, we're going to go to Stephen Lung from Sportsnet. Hey, Dan. Thanks for doing this, man. Yep. Um, just like you, you mentioned the kind of uncertainty, obviously, around this entire situation. I, I'm just wondering, just like, like kind of more, a little more short term, but like obviously, like we don't really know when free agency is going to open. So I just want to know if, if like decisions that would need to be made in free agency uh, affects the pre-draft process in any way. You know, not really. And, and um, the fact that, that every year the draft comes before free agency, this is something that we're always, we're always dealing with at the draft. Like we never, we try to never base our draft decisions on what may or may not happen in free agency um, in any year. So just the fact that this is happening in November, let alone you know, June and July as, as usual, um, that doesn't really change anything. But I think, you know, everyone's pretty well aware of, we, we have a, a larger than usual uh, free agency class and, and it is, it's something that we'll address when free agency comes. So um, we're gonna just, you know, tackle the draft like we always do and, um, and take it from there. And yeah, uh, just one more for me, but just like kind of a, a general overview, like, uh, like can, you, can you give us your, what your assessment of like what, what this year's draft class is, just like from, from a quality standpoint or like, like just kind of, uh, like qualities that stand point that stand out. I mean, it's a it's a very it seems to be a very balanced draft this year. Which, I mean, for for picking, you know, almost smack dab in the middle of it at, at 29, we we feel pretty confident that we could be looking at you know 50 different players maybe, and just for that one pick because we have really no idea who could go with the 20 picks in front of that pick or the 20 picks after and and. You know, it'll be um, anywhere in between. Got like we have interest in guys in that whole range because it's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uncertainty just because of the typical draft process not being the same. With usually there's a lot of risers and and, and fallers based on on whether it's the draft combine, you know, uh, individual workouts, three on three workouts, all that sort of stuff that isn't happening. So a lot of the same names that we usually would have, you know, maybe bounced around on our list a little more frequently. Like they're still very much in the mix and, and, you know, a handful of those guys will, will probably end up going, you know, well before our pick and, and we'll be looking at some names that we may not expect it at, at, uh, at both of our picks. So it's, um, I'd say, yeah, the best way to describe it is just very balanced. Like there, there's going to be a lot of, of, rotation level players that come out of this draft kind of all across the board. And, and I think probably more than usual, the undrafted market is going to be huge because like usual, the, um, or I should say normally players they, that, you know, maybe early on were expected to go undrafted. They work their way into the draft picture and, and, and that those, those workouts and those, those opportunities for them to do so just didn't happen this year. So a lot of these guys that, have maybe been earmarked unfairly as an undrafted player, they're going to end up on that market and you're going to see guys come out of, come out of nowhere and, and be contributors next year. Thanks a lot, Dan. Next question goes to Rachel Brady from the Globe and Mail. Hey, Dan, how you doing? I'm good. Um, in the absence of, you know, as many opportunities, obviously, to watch these players recently play or to work them out in person, I wondered if, like, there are ways that you guys maybe lean a little more on the analytics and the predictive data that you guys have this year to, like, make decisions about players. Yeah, I don't think I would say we we're leaning on it any more than usual. I think um, kind of to my, my point earlier is, you know, the way that we, we do things as a process already at we already put a lot of emphasis on that and, and, you know, not so much to make the actual pick, but in the process of being up to the draft of, of you know, picking and, and choosing the, the tiers of players that we're looking at. Um, so a lot of, a lot of film work and a lot of analytics, like a lot of that stuff is things that we already do 
And, you know, I think there could be in some, for some teams, maybe they haven't put as much emphasis on that in the past, but I would say it's not really anything different than we ought to do, but there is definitely, you know, that's one good, um, one good, you know, data point that, that in a, in a year like this, it, it's going to carry a lot of weight. And, and what about on draft night? Like, are there differences, I don't know, with, with the television or, or whatever it is that make the night um, different this year and th something that you have to sort of rehearse for, be prepared for with the technology or different things? You know, I, I, I don't really, I don't really know. Honestly, like we've had a lot of discussions internally about like what draft night might even look like. And, you know, we're, we're waiting to hear officially from, from the league on what to expect on that, but no, definitely something that with the different, um, different setup as usual, we're going to be, it's going to feel a little different, but we'll, you know, we'll make the best of it. And, and I think all the technologies and all the, the setups that we usually have at, at OVO for the sorts of things, like we're going to have the same, the same things right in front of us. It'll just be a matter of it looking and feeling a little bit differently, but we're going to make sure it's all set up and ready to go um, at least a week in advance to, to get comfortable with it and, and really start, you know, being, being ready for when, when draft night actually arrives. Thanks, Dan. Next question is for David Aldridge from The Athletic. Hey, Dan, thank you for doing this. Appreciate yep. it. Um, hey, I, I have a slightly different question. I was just wondering if um, now that you've had a few weeks to kind of distill everything that happened in Orlando, um, are there any are there any lessons or any things that happen down there that you think are transferable or applicable to a more regular season? Or was everything that happened down there just so unique and odd that it has to kind of be viewed as its own kind of one-off thing? Uh, you know, a, a little bit of both, honestly. Like, um, it was it was such a unique experience of being able to, you know, live with your, your team. Like, whether it was players or staff, like, you, you just, you – it was so you were so closely intertwined with everybody that you really got a a fun um, you know college dormitory type feel to it of just of of working together towards towards the common goal and and um, um, that was just so unique that I, I don't think that's anything that you'd ever be able to re replicate or or um, or bring towards a, a regular season but you know there was definitely a feeling of all hands on deck down there because the numbers of, of staff and, and, you know, people around was just so much less than we usually have on a daily basis, whether it's here in Toronto or on the road in a, in a regular setting. And so kind of realizing that you can get by with, you know, somewhat of a, of a, a smaller crew and, and, and figure out ways to, to, to problem solve and, and work together and, and, just take care of the the regular tasks that usually go um, kind of unseen by everyone else, but they're, they're they're really important things that have to get done. And and you know we figured out ways to to work together as a staff, and you just kind of you have an appreciation for the jobs that everyone else does on a daily basis. And and you know you realize that when things come up and you, someone needs a hand doing something that isn't regular, like we as an organization are we have the, the capabilities to step up and, and help where, where it's needed. So that, that's definitely something that, you know, going forward as, as we, we plan for, you know, travel parties or, or whatever, like we have a little bit better idea of, of what's, Kate, what's, what's possible and, and, and what can be, can be worked with going forward based on number restrictions, you know? Yeah. Is, is there, a, is there an example of, of when everybody just kind of pitched in and got something done that needed to be done? I mean, I think it's it's kind of all across the board of, of like for for instance, you know, for practices, we usually have our coaching staff is almost you know one coach per player in a, in a normal in a normal gym, but that's just not there. So, you know, you'd be having all different types of people, like assistant trainers, equipment managers, you know, security, whatever, rebounding and helping where they can to make sure that that the players are still getting the same sort of um, practice like setting that they're used to without, 
impacting the the kind of work that's being put in. So just things like that, where you know these these aren't tasks that people normally do. You know, they're they're stepping up as needed because just there's there's not as many um, people there that that you do that. Thank you. Next question goes to Aaron Rose from SI.com. Hi, Dan. Thanks for doing this. Um, I'm wondering with the cancellation of March Madness, if you guys felt that there was something lost that maybe you didn't get to see how guys would react in that kind of setting. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, and even before um, the NCAA tournament, the, the college tournaments too, it just, the, sorry, the conference tournaments are, um, those are two two events that are, are so important for, you know, the the uh, performances under pressure, the just the the different sort of, of environment that are, are really good for for critiquing players and, and getting to see them in, in different settings. And and I think um, it's definitely that I wouldn't say we missed out on something, but it's more of good opportunities to you know, to kind of, it's almost kind of like the the final exam of, of a scouting season where you can go to a conference tournament and you can see, you know, 12 different draft prospects in, in one in one day while you're just sitting in a seat and, and not having that opportunity. I mean, we had it a little bit before some of the tournaments got canceled. Um, but then, you know, kind of into the NCAA tournament, even the NIT, the different sort of postseason events you know, just as importantly, like the, the Portsmouth Invitational, all, all these sorts of things where we see players, a lot of players in one setting, um, it, it definitely hurts the your ability to, to um, you know, get a good feel for the for the group of for the crop of players this year, um, in in one spot. And um, yeah, I, I think probably more than anything, as a fan, it was it was unfortunate to not have NCAA tournament this year to, to just sit and I mean. We as a staff usually at, at the press facility will have four televisions going with four games going and you're you're watching them all at once any chance you get and, and just not having that experience is is probably the most unfortunate part right, and one more if i may um last year was a pretty historic canadian draft class this year it's probably going to be a little weaker but i'm wondering what's your sense it sounds like you've talked you've spoken to a few of the canadians what's your sense of this year's canadian um group you know, it, it, you're right. It's um, it's definitely not as as you know high profile maybe as as it has been the past few years. But you know, it's it's that's no sign on on you know anything against Canadian basketball. I think yeah, the, the few players that are are in the draft are they're interesting, and and you know we always like to um, kind of make sure that we we get to know all these guys, and 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 we don't want to miss anything with any local guys because you know we we kind of pride ourselves in in having a a pretty thorough program in terms of keeping guys developing um from with, with some local ties because it makes it easier for them to get comfortable and and develop as as young players as well so um yeah there, there there's definitely some some interesting players who we see could you know with with the right development the right um the right program put in front of them, they, they could absolutely turn into legitimate NBA players. Thank you. Final question is going to go back to Mike Ganter from the Toronto Sun. Hey, Dan. Sorry. Uh, just one more. The With the international players, I mean, you know, you, you don't get to – the workouts aren't there for the, the North Americans this year. Does it sort of even the playing field a little bit for those guys? And, and because of that, do you think maybe we might see more uh, from the other side uh, getting drafted? Oh, that, that's an interesting thought. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I'd say even the playing field. I think maybe more. You know, I know a handful of them um, of the international players. Like they've come over to the states already, and they're training in the states a little more than I think they normally would. Because usually, in a regular draft, those guys are playing right up until the draft sometimes, to where they don't have the opportunity to come over and do the pre-draft sort of process. So, because of the this situation you know, most of them are now stateside and they're already doing the kind of NBA um, type training um, methods. So I think they're more than anything, they'll probably, you know, wherever they end up getting drafted, I could see them um, when the time comes, when the draft happens, 
they might hit the ground running a little bit quicker than normal because they've already been going through the, you know, very NBA specific style training uh, process that a lot of, you know, pre-draft trainers put players in who are coming out of college. And those guys just don't usually have that. They're not as as comfortable at the NBA three point line because they, you know, they haven't spent a lot of time you know, getting reps up at that distance. Whereas now this summer they've, they've had four or five months of, of doing nothing but that. So there is absolutely a chance that come, you know, whenever it is, it comes time for, for teams to bring their, their new draft picks in. Um, these guys might be a little further along. Um, but in terms of before the draft, I don't know if it would actually impact anything different in terms of numbers of people getting drafted. And, and um, um, I think everyone's kind of in the same boat. It seems like whether they're, they're based in, you know, California or they're based in, in Spain, it, it seems like you're kind of doing everything uh, virtually remotely and, and a lot of film work anyway. So it's, it's, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's really that much different.